Well, it's 8 p.m. on Friday night, and we're back here at Byline, a uh, public affairs show co-sponsored by the Amherst League of Women Voters and Amherst Media. And uh, if you uh, wish to see the show again, you can see it again on Monday evening at 6 p.m., and it shows about 30 minutes before the town council meets uh, when they're meeting on that particular evening. But we're on every Friday night and every Monday night. And if you can't get enough of us, you can also find <laughs> us on uh, Amherst Media's website and also on their YouTube channel. So uh, this show is all about uh, helping us get to know and understand more about our newly elected representatives at our town council and on Beacon Hill. And tonight our guest is Pat DeAngelis, who is a district councilor from District 2. two. <laughs> And uh, Pat is a really interesting person with an amazingly interesting background. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, and then I'm going to throw the ball to her. But uh, Pat is a former dancer, a former activist. Yeah, you're never a former activist, right. an Thank activist, <laughs> a, a former teacher. And she got her, uh, her college degree at age 50 and stepped into the classroom as a professional teacher for the first time a year later. Mm -hmm. So, wow, you have quite a background. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, sir. <laughs> it's really great to uh, have you here this evening, and uh, what an eclectic background. So, with all of that experience, right. what is what are you bringing to the town council table? <laughs> um, you've got experience, you've got skills. You... I, I feel like what I'm bringing is empathy, uh, and um, I was, I've been thinking about that. Uh, what I'm bringing is a real intention to listen and deal with people and deal with uh, the issues that actually impact them um, and finding ways to bring their voices into the process um, of representation and the process of deciding, really deciding things in Amherst. Um, not, yeah, so I think that so that's number and others, one. All right, some other skills. All right, some other skills. Give us some more. <laughs> yeah, we know that you. We know that there's more to you than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been um, as a teacher. Uh, I got involved with summer math for teachers at Mount Holyoke, and it was a process of transforming my own pr uh, practice, mm -hmm. and um, <coughs> eventually that led me to facilitating for them. And then a job in Boston, do, being working with teachers, facilitating their practice. So what I have a lot of experience doing is taking people who don't want to change, who are only in one position, and being able to facilitate their process and being able to find the openings where they're maybe ready to to look and make a change. And I think that's a very important skill. Mm -hmm. um, I also feel like. Um, I got involved with town meeting because I worked on the uh, with Amherst Sanctuary to create the sanctuary bylaw, and that process was really fascinating for me uh, to actually create a law, and, and then begin to see how we had to move it through the town, um, and it eventually led me to um, town meeting as a you know member of town meeting. Um, so what else do I bring? I think I. I uh, bring a willingness to reach consensus and and to find collaborative ways to solve things. Um, I did that in the classroom. I did that as a, uh, in the dance world. I did that um, in my work with teachers and parents. Um, and I, I feel very strongly that you and I can have completely different opinions and um, think we're never going to meet. And if we think about consensus or, or collaborative disputing, maybe, mm -hmm. um, then there's this sense of there's something that you're bringing that's important and something that I'm bringing that's important. And how can we find those connections? And then hopefully, and this has been my experience in larger groups uh, and social action uh, issues, which is that you create something stronger and better. Um, so that my, my idea, even though I think it's the best, can grow very differently uh, and powerfully. And you know, I, I'm glad I stumbled uh, for a moment into social activism because that really does, um, I, it brings skills. 
again in uh, listening and skills in being willing uh, to take risks with what I have to say who, uh, and who I'm ready to speak with, who I'm willing to let into the process. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And finding common ground is, uh, is something that you see as central to the ability to uh, take your ideas and my ideas and form it into some, uh, something that would be a third thing. It right. would not be yours, it would not be mine. Right, it would be ours. It would be ours. Yeah, and that's, that's not a process. We, we use the majority vote thing. Or, yes. uh, and consensus isn't just, oh, we have to agree. There are all kinds of ways to deal you know, with the issue. But the premise that you're working on something together mm -hmm. uh, is, I think, is really basic to making... Uh, any organization, uh, how, no matter how small or how large, have the possibility of positive change and growth. Yeah. Um, you know, you know there are d divisions in Amherst around all kinds of things. I mean, that's a, sort of the town that we are mm -hmm. in many ways. And so if we could stop seeing them as um, divides or walls uh, uh, and see them as places of creative tension, mm -hmm. I think we'd be a lot That's better off. That's a great off. concept, creative tension. Yeah. I, see, I see the dancer in you in that second there when you <laughs> said that, <laughs> because that, that's what you're doing. Right. You're creating, you're taking the music, you're taking body movement, you're bringing right. those together right. to create something. Right. And as a dancer, one of the I moved away from actually music, using music, and created a group called Clearing, which was um, had actors, dancers, poets in it, mm -hmm. uh, and we worked improvisationally. But that improvisation was based on regular practice in the studio, regular knowledge of each other's bodies and and the risks we could take. And I think uh, what I see is my part of my work on the council is doing that regular practice mm -hmm. of doing the reading, of finding the people I need to talk to, and then taking the leaps that you make when you're listening and arguing and trying to create together. Mm -hmm. So so doing know. your homework first, yeah, then coming a, to the yeah. table with an open mind. <laughs> right. And with values with and your positions. Own values but and speaking your own mind right, first right. as part of it, or maybe listening first. But the point yeah. is, you state your position, I state my position, and now we've got to find the common ground and bring it together. Right, and I really think that that's critically important. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been critically important in my life um, as a person, mm -hmm. uh, let alone any of the professional things I've done. Right. Um, and when you sit at the town council table, most of the decisions are made by a vote. A vote basically right. is e each of the 13 of you saying, will you stand on it, right. either by showing your hands or by saying yes or no to right. a pr proposal. But um, it sounds to me like the part that you're going to like the best is sitting in a committee and working with people to try to find that common ground yeah. and build a consensus, create a vision, mm -hmm. and then try to shape that right. and bring so it So therefore, forth. I want to be on every committee. <laughs> but you can't be. I know. You can't be on every committee. <laughs> Nobody can be on every committee, but you still have a voice. But that's going to be interesting. To you. How are you going to handle that tension? Because if you will have wanted to be on every committee <laughs> and you're not on every committee and they come forward with a proposal, how's that work? How's well, that work I think for that you? the the job of the committee is to come forward with a proposal, but it's also to convince us that the proposal is accurate. I think I'm going to be attending some of the committee meetings. Um, as an observer? As and, an observer. Uh -huh. I think uh, I'm asking people who I've worked with in the past around political issues to uh, do some of that watching and listening mm -hmm. for me. Um, I think one of the things that's different about the charter than town meeting is that it, we can have a discussion Mm -hmm. before we vote in the sense of we can postpone the vote. I mean, we can't postpone it very long, yeah. but the fact is that there is an attempt to really discuss things, mm -hmm. uh, not just decide things. Yeah. Um, uh, that's, that's a very important distinction. Discuss mm -hmm. things, not just decide things. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, because okay. not, not one of the three, we don't have the best vision. Maybe 13 people together can create an incredible vision. vision but, right. Yeah and then carry that forward. And, right. and speaking of vision and values, um, it was very um, uh, uh, impressive to me 
Uh, when you made your opening statement on that uh, first uh, meeting where you uh, elected your leadership, each of you got to make a, a couple of minute statement. Right. And what jumped out uh, to, to me was when you said, um, and I think you almost finished with this line, um, I, I want to help create a just and sustainable Amherst. Right. A diverse and just and sustainable Amherst. So go with that. Tell, tell <laughs> us what, the, what did you mean by that? Well, and how do we know when we have a diverse, just, and sustainable Amherst? Mm -hmm. it, it's, um, I think for me, the idea of justice um, or a place that's just is, uh, is a town or an environment where all people are really and truly welcomed. Uh, and integrated into um, the culture. Um, I, I w was once sitting in a workshop on racism as a participant, and they asked me for my vision of Amherst. This was quite a while ago, and I remember talking about something you know, uh, about I wanted people to know poets who were black. I wanted them to know uh, write other writers that are black, not just the white classics and things like that. So when I talk about social justice issues, I really mean how do we create an Amherst where it's safe for anyone to be in the street? And um, I think we have a really decent police department, um, and I know that they've been doing some uh, work around restore, hopefully restorative justice practices. Mm -hmm. I would like to see them engage in um, some uh, training around racial issues and things like that. Um, I see justness in how do we create housing that includes everyone. I mean, the, the typical uh, way of doing it is if you make lower or moderate income housing, it's pushed off here. Uh, even Olympia uh, Place or Olympia yeah. is it's drive. beautiful. It's beautiful, but it's all low income. So um, how do we create living situations where we have a mix of incomes, we have a mix of race, we have a mix of abilities? And since I've lived in that kind of situation, I know how it challenged me, um, and that's what I hope for us in Amherst, all of us, to, is to be challenged around our assumptions and beliefs. So that's one thing. In terms of sustainability... And that relates to both justice and diversity. Yes, it does. Yeah, it does. And another thing is... Well, the idea of sustainability... Uh, it really means that we find we have enough to uh, take care of our needs now, but we're also making sure that we ha that our future children uh, have what they need, and that's a different attitude than we've had in this country. Um, it, you know, it means looking at energy sources and all of those things, and it, it's maybe becoming overused, but the. Um, maybe a word to replace it with is some kind of resilience um, in the community, uh, both in, term, in terms of interactions between people and how we create, how we develop and what we develop in downtown Amherst to increase the tax base. Mm -hmm. And what do, we, what do we look at and what positions do we honestly take? Um, I don't know. Yeah, and uh, in the December 17th, <laughs> no, the December 10th meeting, I believe it was, when uh, there was a conversation about the committees, yeah. <laughs> um, you, uh, you carried this forward again, which was very interesting to me. You uh, basically started to talk about, um, uh, you connected economic development and sustainability, uh, sustainability right. in that conversation because you wanted to make sure that by the time all the committees were set up, that there was a place where um, sustainability, because it wasn't in, in the jurisdiction of any of the three first yeah, or four, or, four yeah. of, of uh, initial established right. uh, standing committees. Right. And so uh, it was interesting to me that you took that next step and you linked it and you, you shifted a little bit. You didn't give up what you said before, but you shifted. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> and you joined economic <laughs> development in the conversation. Right. So well, how does that work? Well, s sustainable economic development really applies the same principle, that we create what we need, but we look to the future. So it means using more renewable sources. It means using biode biodegradable and natural uh, products. It's looking at construction practices that don't endanger the environment. Mm -hmm. So there, there are 
there are things like that that we can look at economically. Um, and a lot of people start saying, oh, it's going to make everything more expensive. But if we, if we ever <laughs> take uh, the long-term view and look at what we gain over time, then I think we can make better decisions than we're making. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about um, the way we use space to create housing and everything else. We, uh, you know, we make these large buildings and uh, there's very little, there are, there's no room for um, lower moderate income people in mm -hmm. them. Um, you know, um, <laughs> but we could be building buildings that were inclusive, and if you used inclusionary zoning um, and practices. I, I was reading an article in the Globe several months ago about um, a housing development created by two architects. It houses nine families, 28 people in 4,500 square feet. Wow. And it goes up, mm -hmm. but it's built, it's built beautifully. Um, it's colorful, it's, the structure is not just this glass and thing. Yeah. And it's been purposefully designed so that there is a common area on the first floor and that the families can see each other. There's no mm. place in it where you can't see other people so that you have this sense of community. So when we're looking at the buildings we're building, whether or not we like what they look like or not, how are we going to use them to benefit everybody? Mm -hmm. And do they have to look like that? And is there a way, I mean, if you're thinking about nine families on 4,500 square feet, that's a very different kind of development than the, the sprawl that we're seeing right. moving into some of the um, farmland and things around Amherst and in Amherst that are, that are gonna change the character. Uh, and I think in, in some negative ways and impact us environmentally in terms of water usage and things. Yeah, your excitement about that development that you just oh, described, yeah. uh, that reminded me uh, you, had an, you were involved in co-housing uh, in, uh, in years gone by. Yeah. What was that experience? <laughs> that I, for five years, um, my wife, well, she wasn't my wife then because we couldn't, my partner Carol and our three-year-old son moved into the Pomeroy Lane Cooperative which wasn't okay. specifically co-housing, but it was built on a co-housing model. Okay. So there was a small community house, um, and there were, t I think, 25 of us, 25 families, and um, we were mixed income, Section 8, um, mm -hmm. low income, and market rate people. We were every color uh, that you could possibly be. We were, um, some of us were lesbian, um, most people were straight, and that became some tension for a little while. Mm -hmm. uh, we had it also within the master deed required people with physical or uh, cognitive challenges yeah. to be included in right. the development. So again, there was this richness of right. difference, and that that living situation was phenomenal for me. Um, it challenged a lot of my basic assumptions mm -hmm. about who I was and who other people were. And that's, I, th I think, if we want to talk about justice, if we want to talk about um, changing the culture of this country, we really need to find those situations. Um, I'll share it one story, I think. Sure, um, please. The first, all 25 families moved in at the same time. All at the same time. Yeah, Talk right. about. <laughs> right, exactly, and it was winter. Yeah. And one family, uh, I, I don't remember why, did not stay very long, and they left and their unit was open briefly, and their pipes burst, and it flooded the courtyard. Every, the uh, unit, the townhouses and, and accessible apartments were built facing a courtyard uh, with parking way over there. Anyway, um, it was complete ice. And we had a couple, Juan and Tori, uh, who both had cerebral palsy, both Paralympic, people who'd been traveling around the world and winning medals, bronze and gold medals. Um, and they lived at the far end of the community. And so they could get there around the back, but you really kind of had to go through the middle of the community. And I wasn't thinking anything about it. And my neighbor, William, came running over and he said, Pat, Pat, you've got to go talk to Juan. He's crawling across the ice. And I'm like going, oh, well, we can't have that. We can't have that. So I went over to speak to Juan and Tori. 
And I said, Juan, I found out that you're coming home from work and you're crawling across the ice. I said, you don't have to do that. We can figure something out. And Tori just, and his, his sister was there too. And they started laughing. And they just said, if Juan wanted help, Juan would ask for help. And mm -hmm. then Juan looked at me and he said, hey, Pat, when we have the community potlucks, don't I ask you to carry my plate? Because of the way he walked, uh -huh. he couldn't do that. Okay. And so it's a startling lesson. So what yeah. I said was, oh, I get it. You are perfectly okay crawling across the ice, and we've got to get used to looking at it. If that's what you decide you yeah. need to do. And if you, you know, I, I feel like that, le that was an amazing lesson yeah. for me. And I carry it over in terms of when I think about creating uh, housing for people who are potentially homeless. Mm -hmm. uh, I've always said it should have services in it. And, and, uh, and I got challenged by Tracy from the uh, Survival Center. And she said, no, people have a right to live without services and to choose how they live. And I heard that echo of that story. You know, mm -hmm. if I need help, I'll yes. ask for help. And I can do, you know. So that brings us back to your <laughs> your themes earlier about empathy, yeah, and listening and mm -hmm. being open to seeing the other person's point of view or way mm -hmm. of wanting to do it and accepting it. Yeah, and not yeah, and and allowing ourselves to be challenged, mm -hmm. you know. And if we carry that to a, a larger perspective, as a community that does need development to help sustain us and, and uh, so that our taxes aren't flying everywhere. We, we need that development, but what does it need to look like? What, right. And that is right now we think restaurants. And what restaurants would that sustainable and, development look like? Right, what would it look like? And, and to me, it would look like uh, a collaborative or cooperative cold storage uh, system for uh, farmers. Uh, mm -hmm. That's something that they need. Um, and, and I've been talking to yeah. Sarah, so I don't want to okay. claim. <laughs> uh, it's okay. Um, Sarah Swartz, the yes, uh, uh, yes. uh, another and, town councilor. Right. right. And right. one of the things that um, I was talking about when I was responding to her in that conversation was my son's, one of his roommates, Sarah, rents space in a certified kitchen in Boston, and she's starting a baking company. Uh -huh. And it gives her the opportunity to make food for farmers markets and also online. And she doesn't have to have all this stuff, but you know. And if we had something like that in Amherst, then there are things that people who could be creating small businesses using that collaborative. Um, the bank uh, downtown on Main Street. Amherst and, Works. Yes, that yeah. was a phenomenal mm -hmm. idea. They didn't tear down the building, yeah. so that's sustainable, right. right? And what they did was make cooperative workspace. So that, you know, I think those are really good ideas. Um, and so what other businesses could we have besides restaurants and things like that? Um, what can we do to uh, uh, make Amherst walkable, bikeable, blah, 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 mm -hmm. in stages that don't impact everybody negatively? Because right now we are a car-oriented society still. Right. You know, and yeah. so what I feel like, and, and the reason I wanted to be on this uh, economic and development sustainable. and sustainable yeah. committee that is now called the committee that shall not be named because <laughs> we're working on it, um, was to, to sort of find a way um, to really research and get, understand the impact of decisions. Because like every other group of people, we make this decision, and it may be a really good one, but we didn't notice what else it was going to affect. What, yeah, and so the if unintended we, consequences. Yeah, and mm -hmm. how do we anticipate some of those yeah. and begin to understand what they are? That yeah. contributes to sustainability. Um, yeah. And not just, but also community sustainability. Right. You know, how do we engage people in the, not just in the political process, but how do we engage people in Amherst? And, you know, we have, um, am I talking too much? No, this is exactly <laughs> okay. why you're here. You're here okay. for the purpose of ha helping us understand more about who you are. I um, Thank you. <laughs> I was um, 
uh, in favor when I was at a meeting of the preferred North Common plan. I thought the decisions were really good. And the, but it, it did have a loss of parking, and it kind of made town hall a little bit more important than maybe it should be. But I started listening to what other people were saying and some of the consequences of it. And then I thought, hell, where are we going to get the money to do it? You know, we have schools, we have DPW, we have these other issues. How are we going to do this without increasing taxes so that people are leaving Amherst? Um, and I realized, why aren't we asking the master gardeners in town to come and volunteer time? Why aren't we asking elementary through high school students to come and work on revamping the common? That's kind of a community engagement that we don't think about. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting know. to me that you are thinking about sustainability in as broad a way as you are, but you're, you are really making sure that there's a big focus on uh, its impact on the economy and the economy's yeah. impact on sustainability. Right. That's so interesting to me because I think most people, when they think about sustainability, they only think about the environment. Right, and but you can't have one anymore without, without the, other. the other. And you're looking at a much broader way of thinking about sustainability, which involves the economy, it involves, right. uh, it all involves diversity, Mm -hmm. It involves equity. Yeah. It involves justice. Right. There, there are, you know, basic principles are, are of sustainability if you include the idea of not just environmental sustainability, but community or, or mm -hmm. uh, sustainability of communities. You've got to look at what's being created for people. And a lot of these changes create jobs and create mm -hmm. reasons to be here. Um, we can bring tourists to Amherst, not just because we have fancy plays, although mm -hmm. that would be nice because we don't much. Um, or the, we have or Amherst go, Cinema. I know, which I love. And we have our colleges I really with a love. lot of wonderful stuff Right. There. But you can also bring people to Amherst on tour because we have net zero buildings or, you know, and or As you can have the bandstand. This is and, yeah, uh, and the uh, the Hitchcock right, Center. and that we're requiring in terms of municipal development from right. uh, and renovation. That's right. And the other piece is I'm, I was looking at uh, some of the library designs, and the People's Choice Award was a, a bandstand that had a green roof. Wow! Right? Excellent. Incredible. Uh, that wasn't pay even though it was the people's choice. They went back to the traditional where Olmsted had it, blah blah blah, mm -hmm. and that's a mistake in Amherst because it, if you want to bring people here, let's bring them for environmental reasons, and then they go to the restaurants, and then they find out how good the cinema is, you know, and things like that. Well, this has been a fascinating <laughs> conversation, and we've we've accomplished our goal here, which was to get to understand more about you and how you mm. think about things and what your hopes are as a member of the council. So thank you for joining thank us. Thank you, Stan. And thank you for joining us, and we'll look forward to seeing you all again soon.